thank you everyone thank you everyone for uh coming to um uh, today's uh, uh meeting the day three of the first annual international congress on Iglinois. so yesterday we uh basically um looked at Iglinois through the lens of ecology and environment and I, on monday we looked at Iglinois through the lens of the basic biology and basic understanding so today we're going to be talking about the evolution of Eugolinois, and uh, we'll also have a series of speakers, keynote speakers and um, invited speaker, and also our presentations to listen to. So I would like to invite Emma Kazakski, who will um, uh, give a, a, an introduction on the proceedings and a recap of yesterday's meeting, and then introduce the chair for the, the first session today. Emma, are you on the call today now? All right. I am. Hello. All right, go for it, Emma. Yeah. So yesterday we had talks about um, ecological euglenoids. So talking about things like we saw um, how euglenoids are affecting the environment around the world for different individuals and what they are doing to help remediate those situations, as well as hearing from individuals about future explorations and how we're going to learn about these euglenoids and what is going to be done with being able to push our research forward. So it was really exciting to hear our talks from Emble with Edith. Uh, that was really great if you guys were able to listen to that yesterday. And I also spoke yesterday, which I was pretty happy about. So that was very fun. Thank you again for that opportunity. Thank God I really enjoyed that. And today we're going to be moving on to our third topic. Yes, today is the third day. Um, and who is chairing us today? Thank God. Um, Vladimir Hampel. All right. So Vladimir, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Emma. So uh, let's let's get it started. Yes, today uh, we will our topic will be evolution, and in the first part we have one keynote speaker and one invited speaker. So I would like to ask Julius Lukas, who is our keynote speaker, to share his screen. Julius, uh, is share screen. Julius is from. Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good. Yeah, fine. We can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Julius is from the University of Czech Republic, Czech Republic, and uh, he will tell us something about evolution of parasitism, kinetoplastids, and euglenoid perspectives. So please, Julius, go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks to thank God he has it in his name after all the thanks for really pushing this uh, forward uh, and organizing the whole thing. Uh, so um, today I would like to tell you uh, uh, the, uh, in a few minutes uh, why uh, uh, free-living euglenosons can be very informative for parasitologists uh, who study trypanosomes, leishmania, and other um, serious parasites. Um, uh, um, in uh, that are distantly related to uh, to euglenids. Uh, here are the people who uh, collaborated or helped me with uh, acquiring this data. Uh, they come mostly from Czech Republic, but also Belgium, uh, Canada, and Scotland. Uh, uh, you probably most of you know that uh, humans are here, as you can see, uh, far distant from uh, so-called excavates, or some already consider this supergroup uh, outdated, but uh, for the purposes of today's talk, it's fine. And there are three uh, related groups, uh, kinetoplastids, diplonemids, and euglenids. And we can see them here morphologically, so uh, probably the best known is uh, Trypanosoma, uh, kind of a textbook parasite. Uh, uh, then Diplonemids, uh, represented here by Diplonema papillatum. Uh, those are much, much less known organisms, but uh, within the last five years, and really not more than five years, they definitely emerged from obscurity 
and uh, diplonimids, which were studied before 2015, if, before the Tara expedition by perhaps one lab in the world, turned out to be maybe the most diverse eukaryotes in the world ocean and uh, belong to the six or seven uh, most uh, abundant eukaryotes, uh, single cell eukaryotes in, in, in the ocean. So they are ecologically extremely important and also biologically uh, very, uh, very interesting and uh, telling. And the third group is uh, the topic of, of, the today, uh, of, of this week's conference, Euglenids, again represented here by Euglena gracilis. To the, uh, to the right, you see uh, scanning electron micrographs uh, uh, and also guppy staining that shows that in trypanosomes, the, there is two places where the DNA is located, the nucleus, of course, and the kinetoplast or mitochondrial DNA. You see an enormous amount of DNA in diplonemids, and indeed, their mitochondrion contains the biggest amount of DNA ever recorded in any organelle. So there is more DNA, um, not more genes, but more DNA in the uh, mitochondria in a single mitochondrion of diplonemids than in their nucleus, and then euglenids, which also have a single mitochondrion, highly reticulated, but with very low amount of, of DNA. This is a, a, a scheme, a, a little bit more detailed scheme uh, with the emphasis on diplonemids and kinetoplastids. So I apologize that I did not elaborate on euglenids here. Uh, they are used as outgroups. This postguardians, that's another potentially fourth group uh, added, uh, but extremely obscure and difficult to study, no, uh, nothing in culture. So, uh, and this reflects uh, the, the view uh, of phylogenetic relationships between euglenozoans that the euglenids are basal to diplonemids and kinetoplastids, um, which, which was not clear until quite recently. This is uh, uh, already a more detailed phylogeny, uh, which uh, serves as a blueprint for a few more slides that I will show later on. Uh, uh, we have uh, plenty of genomes, uh, actually hundreds of genomes of the parasitic uh, trypanosomatids, uh, the upper part of, the, of this tree. Uh, we have uh, much less information from diplonemids and uh, euglenids. In fact, uh, only euglena gracilis has a highly uh, high quality genome. And, and as we heard yesterday, uh, the Japanese guys are making major progress in this and also the initiatives to sequence more uh, euglenids uh, are um, in progress. So that's great. And, and we will uh, have much more information anytime soon. Uh, in this tree, you see that the parasitism evolved several times independently. Uh, it certainly happened twice or probably three times in kinetoplastids. There is also one potentially parasitic lineage, at least one in diplonemids, while the uh, accounts uh, associating euglenids with parasitisms are uh, um, rare and, and with a big question mark all over it. So we can con safely consider all diplone or euglenids still as, as free living. Uh, here is a summary or statistics of, uh, of the genes, uh, genomes. And as you can see, the Busco coverage for Euglena gracilis is high. Uh, actually for Rhabdomonas costata, uh, also uh, decent quality. So, uh, um, so at least uh, we have something to work with, uh, reliable. Uh, the number of proteins, uh, you can see that's very uh, interesting that, um, that the parasitic lineages tend to lose genes and tend to lose pathways. Of course, they um, reacquire new functions, but in general, they have lower number of um, protein coding genes, significantly lower than the, their free living um, ancestors or predecessors. And uh, it's worth noting that, for example, hemistasia, the diplonym in hemistasia has somewhere around 50,000 protein coding genes. So that's more than twice than humans. 
uh, and we are shooting uh, rockets into the sky. So it's intriguing uh, that uh, the uh, unicellular organisms can be so complex and um, it's, it's uh, exciting to, to study them. Uh, so uh, what is the comparative power now between uh, uh, euglenids and let's say the parasitic kinetoplastids, uh, mainly triponosomatids, uh, that are really the kind of textbook parasites. Uh, so for example, uh, and, and uh, as, as they are um, parasites that can be cultivated, their life cycle can be um, produced in, in the lab, uh, uh, they, they are intensely studied by hundreds of labs and, and uh, there are tens of thousands of papers on Trypanosoma brucei uh, only, um, resulting in pretty much uh, elimination of the sleeping sickness, of the human sleeping sickness uh, from Africa and, and um, let's say, good knowledge about these organisms. So uh, when I studied 30 years ago and worked uh, in, in Amsterdam and in, in Czechoslovakia in those days, uh, we, uh, the textbook said that uh, the unique feature, one of many uh, unique features of trypanosomes is polycystronic transcription uh, and uh, transplicing of a splice leader uh, to their five prime ends. And that this is caused by the parasitic lifestyle, it's streamlining, and there was a lot of discussion, how, how unique this is among eukaryotes. So, of course, at that time, nobody was looking into euglenids uh, or, or, or free-living kinetoplastids. But now we know from this that, no, this feature has nothing in common with parasitism. Euglenids have it all, um, uh, pretty much exactly the same. Um, so uh, this feature certainly predated the switch to parasitism. Uh, another specific and uh, really highly studied and, and uh, exciting feature of, of trypanosomes, all of them, is that they have a mitochondrial DNA uh, composed of a big network of maxi circles and mini circles, and it's worth uh, hours of uh, lectures. Uh, so, of course, it was, uh, uh, we were curious whether this feature is, is ancestral, and it's not. Euglenids, diplonimids have none of that. So it, it somehow uh, emerged later on and who knows, may have some connection with parasitism. Then about 40, almost 40 years ago, there was a seminal paper almost uh, uh, on, on the level of Nobel prizes when in trypanosome, mitochondrion and kinetoplast, uh, the transcripts were found to be edited and the, uh, they are edited by the insertions and deletions of uridines as shown here. So, and, and the process uh, proceeds from the three prime end to the five prime end, and the post-transcriptionally added uridines are in red, the small letters, and the post-transcriptionally removed uridines uh, that were encoded in the DNA are in blue stars, and uh, they are taken out. So this is just one gene, uh, and as you can see, more than 500 uridines are added post-transcriptionally. Uh, dozens of uridines are uh, removed and some uridines stay actually. So hell broke loose as uh, when the uridines are um, concerned. And when you translate this, uh, even the stop code or start code initiation codon is generated by uridine. And when you translate this, you end up with a pretty normal ATPA6, which has decent homology with human, but humans have no editing. So uh, Nobel Prize winners like uh, Tom Czech were speculating in paper journals like Cell and Science uh, that this is an extremely ancestral mechanism, that this is a remnant of the RNA world when RNA was editing itself and so on. So it was quite, uh, it, it was certainly on everybody's mind uh, how is it in the non-parasitic or other lineages? And now we know there is no RNA editing in mitochondrial transcripts of euglenids. There is not even that machinery of about 75 proteins that, that does all this work. So we can safely conclude 
that RNA editing in its uh, um, bizarre uh, baroqueness and complexity evolved much later, only when uh, when the uh, trypanosomatids uh, or kinetoplastids separated from uh, from the free living lineages. Uh, this plot shows. Uh, done by Angelica, a uh, bioinformatician, is complicated for uh, uh, just uh, the take home message here is that uh, look at the column to the right, which shows that uh, despite the big differences in their lifestyle, I mean, from free living to uh, commensal or um, symbiotic or parasitic, uh, these groups, uh, Again, diplonemids, euglenids, and kinetoplastids share bulk of their metabolism and share a substantial part of, of their, uh, of their uh, proteins. And so uh, in the end, uh, we produced a, a table. Uh, this is published where we compared um, most of the features that were considered unique to trypanosomes and leishmanias as compared to other eukaryotes with what we have found in diplonemids and euglenids. And the pattern is rather complex. As you can see here, some features like uh, polycystronic transcription, uh, tr massive transplicing, the presence of the unique base J, uh, and so uh, fatty acid synthesis of the type two they are common to all of them and they must be really ancestral. While other features that were considered actually ancestral um, before this comparative analysis are simply not and emerged later for, for one reason or another. Uh, so that's um, one nice case how this uh, comparative analysis is telling. And we can dig deeper. And so, for example, uh, when we look into kinetochore proteins that were described a few years back uh, by uh, Keith Gauss lab in, in cell paper, uh, that the kinetochore of kinetoplastids is extremely divergent from all kinetochores of all other eukaryotes that are pretty conserved, can be really mapped in the genomes and, and the homologs can be identified uh, in a pretty straightforward way. So we wondered how is how are the kinetochores in euglenids? Are they of the kinetoplast type or are they of the all other eukaryotes type? And they, there we cannot make any conclusions at this point other than they, we can say safely that they are different from kinetoplastids. So either we have extreme diversity of kinetochore proteins in, in the euglenozoans as a whole, or uh, there is a, the major diverse, uh, diversity happened, especially again in the parasitic claim. So that's, that this is now being studied. And the only way how to identify such proteins is to really tag them, pull them down, which, which means to, to turn euglena, uh, some euglenid, uh, preferentially euglena gracilis, into genetically tractable organism where you really can knocking genes, knock them out uh, on a scale of, let's say, a good student uh, bringing one every month uh, and, and then pull down proteins uh, that uh, go with the tag protein and, uh, and study the protein complexes. This is, this we are now doing in diplonemids, in euglenids, this may still be challenging, but, but there are good cases and we, we have seen, we have had already here about some of them. Again, this is a complex slide, but uh, just the message uh, shows uh, that there is a, a loss of pathways going up in the tree. So euglenids are extremely versatile in their metabolism. They have uh, plenty, they have uh, tens of thousands of genes. They are, I would say, uh, they are ready to survive under uh, extremely varied circumstances because they, they can tweak their metabolism, they can, they can react. Uh, and with the parasitism, uh, what came in is the loss of, of a number of, 
of, uh, of, of a substantial fraction of, of this, uh, this capacity. This is shown here, uh, where you have uh, uh, some kind of uh, comparison uh, in the, uh, between free living and parasitic um, protists, uh, especially in, in euglenozoans. And as you can see, uh, the number of metabolic proteins encoded in the genomes of free living uh, ones is, is higher than in the parasitic or symbiotic lineages. And uh, so, so from all this, it looks that euglenids are complex cells. But we wanted to look, for example, in the mitochondria. So Michael, who spoke in the first day of, the, of this conference, uh, isolated uh, uh, with the help of others, a very pure mitochondrion and identified um, the components of and, and he ended up with Julius. Mm -hmm. I would like to just remind you that you are at the end of your time slot. Okay, okay, just sorry for that. Now. I will speed it, speed it up. So the, he ended up with somewhere around 1800 proteins, which is extremely uh, protein rich mitochondria. And, and here is like, uh, and again, there is a nice comparative power of these studies because we, we know excellent. Uh, uh, high quality mitoproteome of trypanosomes. So we can, for example, see how the import uh, apparatuses look like. We can compare the iron sulfur cluster assembly, again, more complex in euglena than in trypanosomes and, and for this uh, matter in other eukaryotes. And here are the conclusions. So euglenids are basal to both diplonemids and kinetoplasts. They carry molecular feature, features, number of them, previously associated solely with parasitism. Uh, they have probably the most uh, complex mitochondrion studied so far. Uh, their um, pathways, um, th there are, they have more metabolic pathways than the uh, parasitic kinetoplastids. And using diplonemids and euglenids as outgrouped allowed us to shed some light on the evolution of several molecular features, features uh, previously considered uh, associated with parasitic trypanosomatidae. And I believe this is the funding. Uh, most of it comes from the Czech sources, uh, Czech Ministry of Education, uh, but also Moore Foundation uh, was generous and, and the funding of, of our collaborators. And I believe that we will find major departures from the textbook eukaryote in uh, while digging deeper into the euglena cell. Thanks for your attention. So thank you very much, Julius, for your lecture. Uh, we will leave the discussion uh, at the, uh, for the time after the second lecture. So please use the chat to ask the question throughout, if you wish, and I will read them then later. And without any further ado, I will ask our second speaker, Professor Eric Linton, to share his screen. Okay, I can already see it. So I would like to uh, invite our invited speaker, Eric Linton, from Central Michigan University, USA. Thank you for that introduction and thank you to thank God and everyone else for arranging this and inviting me to it. Uh, hopefully everybody can see what I have here. And again, I wanna talk mostly about euglenoids and euglenophyta and secondary endosymbiosis of the chloroplasts, which is the area I've worked most on uh, other than phylogenies. So this is gonna be kind of a review of a few things and going through our current state and what we've learned so far <clears throat> and where we need to go. And again, I'm gonna highlight a few particular areas. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about primary endosymbiosis. I think everybody's familiar with that. Secondary endosymbiosis and euglenoids, just a slide. Uh, the diversity of euglenophytas morphology, again, both in their body forms and in chloroplast types. And then finally, I'm going to summarize some of the major evolutionary changes in the chloroplast genome that we've observed through the sequencing of many of these genomes in the last 10 to 12 years. <clears throat> So first, uh, again, uh, this is from Bellwitch. And again, primary endosymbiosis was again, the eukaryote ate the cyanobacterium. And we ended up with green algae, several other groups here, but in our case, we're talking about the green algae and eventually the, the high dry algae known as land plants. 
Now, secondary symbiosis in eulonoids led eulonoids to be one of the first organisms that uh, were again, initially phagotrophic and then later became phototrophic uh, by a secondary symbiosis. And this makes them one of the first groups or one of the older groups to have both uh, uh, chloroplast and mitochondria within the same groups. Now, again, the primary endosymbiosis occurred. But again, what happened in euglenoids is we had a phagotrophic euglenoid, which we'll talk more about later, which ate a green algae, as opposed to eating a cyanobacteria up here in the primary endosymbiosis. It ate a green algae, something from this group. And instead of digesting it, it decided to, you know, keep it and let's make food from here. And this led to the type of secondary endosymbiosis. Again, there were several lines, including tertiary endosymbiosis. But what we're talking about here is the green lineage, which ended up again by phagotrophic euglenoid eating a green algae of some type. And we ended up with euglenophyta going from euglenozoa to euglenophyta. <clears throat> now, based on molecular evidence, the most probable donor for this that led to euglenoids with photosynthesis was, um, uh, sorry, Paramomonas or a persinophyte like organism. And the one that's most closely associated with that now is Paramomonas parquet. And this was done by Turmel et al. in 2009. And again, this was also uh, emphasized and supported by Wingert's et al.'s work in 2012, where they compared the genomes. One thing I want to point out again is the morphology, and we'll get to the chloroplast genomes in a moment, is in parquet here. The chloroplast is a single chloroplast, uh, comes at the bottom and has lobes, four to eight lobes, and has a single pyrenoid at the bottom. And as you can see, the cell cycles here. But I'm going to focus on the chloroplast morphology. Now, after acquiring the chloroplast, euglenoids, and then became photosynthetic, seem to have diversified quite a lot, quite a lot, including, again, these pictures just showing some of the diversity here, where we have, again, still all single cells, but we have small ones. We have long spindle-shaped ones, such as in here. We have flat ones. We have rounded, twisted ones. We have some that form colonies or pseudocolonies, depending on what I talk about. We have some that form cases here, like a trachlomonas. We have phacus, trachlomonas, monomorphina. So we have a huge variety of morphology types that occurred after the acquisition of chloroplast. Additionally, even though the acquisition was probably a single event, and we had one type of chloroplast, the chloroplast and euglenoids have diversified greatly. Um, if you look here, we have small disc-shaped chloroplast. We have large shield shape with pyrenoids, um, some with lobes, some without. We have reticulate chloroplast. We have stellate shaped chloroplast and we have ribbon-like chloroplast. So we have a huge variety. And again, some with pyrenoids as in the primomonas had one, some with diplopyrenoids, some with haplopyrenoids, and some lacking pyrenoids at all. So after the acquisition of chloroplasts, euglenoids seem to have diversified greatly in their physical morphology, but also a lot in their uh, morphology of their chloroplast. Which led to the question, how diverse are the chloroplast genomes of euglenoids since they show a huge morphological diversity? Now, let's go back to the beginning here with parquet. And if you look at its structure, it's a traditional green algal type structure, 110 genes, a single intron. It has the inverted repeats in the small, uh, in the small uh, single copy area and the large single copy area. And again, it's a little over 100,000 bases. So it's comparable to most green algae genomes. It has the major structures, including that found in land plants with the inverted repeats. And again, this is from 2009. Now, before that, all we had was the chloroplast genomes of Euglena grassless and the uh, plastid genome of Euglena longa, formerly Astasia longa, as it is colorless. And if you compare it, you'll see there's a reduction in the number of genes and a great increase in the number of introns. Additionally, both of these genomes lack the inverted repeats that would be found there, but instead had tandem repeats of, of the rRNAs of about three times. Additionally, the genomes were quite larger, even though uh, Stasia was kind of large, it had lost most of its photosynthetic genes. It was still a good sized genome based on what it's lost. So as you can see, as time went by, it changed and reorganized a lot. And for quite a long time, as this was done in 93 and again repeated in 2015, this is what we thought 
the chloroplast genome of all euglenoids would be like. We had two representatives, this tandem repeat. So it looked very different. And this was our idea of what we thought maybe most look like in this area if it was a single acquisition. However, again, for about the last 10 or 12 years, we've had a lot more chloroplast genome sequenced. And in fact, I just used this figure from uh, this paper here, as I think it summarizes it pretty well, that we now have a lot of copies of chloroplast genomes from Euglena and from other Euglenacea. We have one or two versions of that. And we have several copies from Ficacea and from Eutryptiales. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any yet from Rapazel yet, and I'll mention that at the end. So we have a lot to compare now, more than we've ever had in the past. And in fact, uh, these are all the ones that I'm aware of sequence right now, and I, hopefully I didn't miss anything lately, but I tried to go through it all. And currently we have about 19 chloroplast genomes from Euglenaceae, about nine from Ficaceae, and three from Eutryptiales. And I just kind of want to go through the major features and things that we have found from these so far. Again, this is from work done from my lab, Rich Schumer's lab, Harda's lab, Turnell's lab. So there's a lot of labs who have produced this over the last 10 years or so. Uh, first, the chloroplast genome, we start at the bottom, the, uh, the parquet, I'm just going to go with that, is by 100,000. As you can look over this, you'll see here in the Eutryptia and the Eutryptiales, uh, the genomes are much smaller with the exception of Pomaquintensis uh, being much larger. If you look at the Ficaceae, again, the genomes are much smaller than, you know, quote, the original donor genomes. And up in the Euglenaceae, the majority of the genomes up here are again smaller than the donor genome, with some exceptions in certain groups and certain lineages being much larger. Now, even though those genomes have changed in size a lot, uh, there's a core set of proteins, and this doesn't show them all, but most of the proteins that they all share in common. It's about 90 proteins that they all have in common with each other. Now, many of them have lost these, which is uh, Parquet has in. And these are not in the euglenoids, or at least not been found so far. But these genes are found in all euglenoids, as you can see the groupings marked here. Uh, but again, it's not all of them in this list, but there's about 90 in common. So if you look at the number of genes, again, it varies somewhat. Some have a few less, some have a few more. But in general, there's about 90 genes compared to the 110. So we've lost about 20 genes, roughly, between the time of the acquisition and the evolution of the euglenophyta. Now, the genomes, as you see, have gotten smaller, but some larger. But what we've also increased over time is the number of introns. So the chloroplast genomes have really gathered a lot of introns over this time. Again, uh, Parquet had one down in this area. We've added a few, 50, only eight here and 27 here. We've added a lot more in the Ficaceae, as you can see. Some have low amounts, some have high amounts. Uh, but where the biggest changes were, were up in the Euglenaceae. Again, we have normally around 80 or so, 70 to 80 introns, but in a few lineages, such as in Strombo and Calatium, and especially in certain lineages of Euglena, we have a lot more introns where again, we've had a huge proliferation of these. Also, the percent GC content has changed quite a bit over time. Uh, initially, it was in about the mid thirties. And now if you look for most of the Euglenoids, it's in the mid to high twenties. Again, this decrease in GC content is mostly due to the introns, which have more um, AT rich than the rest of the genome itself. And that's led to the decrease in the GC content. Now, a major feature I want to point out here in this paper, again, is from um, Anna Karnowski, uh, Karnikowski and Bennett and Tremer in 2018. Uh, did I, did yeah. Eric, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I just want to warn you that you are also at the end of your time yeah. slot. I'm going to, yeah, I'm almost done here. So yeah, if you I look think at we here, have time. Yeah, the major features I want to point out here on this is the inverted repeat. Again, the donor or donor like had the inverted repeat. And if you look in the Euglenaceae, the uh, basal members have the, have the inverted repeat, but not Eutreptia. Eutreptiellas, but not Eutreptia. Uh, we also find the inverted repeat in the Ficaceae in two of the lineage, Lepocinclus and Discoplastus, but we don't find it in Ficus. We also don't find it up here in the lineage of all the Euglenaceae. This indicates that we've had at least three losses of the inverted repeat over time. So if you look at the last one, in this case, the inverted repeat has been lost and most of them are single repeats with a few lineages having tandem repeats. Thus, we have basically two chloroplast genome types that are available in Euglenoids, those with inverted repeats 
and those with either a single repeat or tandem repeats range in this way. Uh, overall, in my conclusions, the acquisition of chloroplast is supported by this, that it was a single event, that the Utreptiella chloroplast genome most closely represents that of the Paramomonas. Again, something like this was probably the probable donor, not the current one we had, but some ancestor of that. A Eutryptiales like organism was probably the initial host, that is something with two emergent flagellum that was bagotrophic and probably living in uh, salt water. Again, many genes were lost early on after the acquisition, so it had a reduction in genes, but an increase in size due to introns. Again, extensive addition of introns, especially type twos and threes, and later twin trons were introduced in the genome. This has caused most of the increase in genome size. And the loss of the inverter repeat has happened at least three independent times within the lineages. Uh, between the different genomes, the genome content is similar, even though the genomes have a lot of diversity in how they're arranged and stuff, but the actual genes are about the same. And many of the genes are arranged in operons. So even though things get switched around, and if we had a moth comparison, you can see it switched around. Most of the genes stay in groups and move around and, and move as a section together. Major evolutionary changes have occurred mostly between genome, uh, between genera. And the most diverse seems to be the genus Euglena in both morphology and molecular diversity. Uh, the nuclear and chloroplast gene phylogenies indicate differing histories, although they do support and strengthen each other when combined. Uh, finally, uh, if we want to continue this, the chloroplast genomes that we would need more of, we would need at least additional one additional of cryptoglena, Euglenaria, Stromomonas. Calatium, Discoplastus, Eutreptia, as we only have one from each of these groups. So at least one other to confirm how the group looks would be useful. Again, always more is better, but at least one more from these groups. And finally, it would be great to have uh, Rapaza, as we don't have it, even though it does eat tank other uh, gene, sorry, the chloroplast from other algae, it does have its euglenoid chloroplast, and it would be great to see what that looks like, as it seems to be maybe the most ancestral of them all. And with that, I am done. Thank you, Professor Linton, for your lecture. I would like to thank both speakers for their talks. And now we have, we are a little bit more over, but we still have almost 20 minutes to discuss. Uh, so uh, questions are piling up in the chat. So feel free to uh, write them there or just raise your hand and I will ask you to speak. So the first question from the chat by Sergio Guerrero to Julius. Thank for your talk, Julius. Can kinetoplastids be considered secondary endosymbionts that lost the chloroplast? Do you know the percentage of identity between euglena and kinetoplastids proteins? Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, well, uh, I, I was thinking probably 20 years ago, there was a PNAS paper from the highly respected laboratory of Fred Opperdox, uh, who claimed that uh, trypanosomatids used to have plastid and lost it secondarily. And, and even more famous scientist, Dutch scientist Piet Borst wrote a commentary uh, on invited commentary on this paper because it was considered really groundbreaking. Uh, in the end, and we were also uh, reanalyzing the data, uh, this turned out to be um, an artifact of small data sets. And when you edit, so it was based on, uh, let's say, sequence similarity of certain proteins that were found in trypanosomes to, uh, to euglenids and, and other um, observations, but it turned out uh, to be an artifact. So it looks that uh, the lineage that formed uh, present-day kinetoplastids um, separated before the acquisition of the plastid. So uh, there was no plastid in the past. It, it is highly like it that way, but who knows? Maybe this will be still revisited. Thank you for the answer. And for you, that is also the second question by Emma Saavedra. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Lukesh, for your interesting talk. In the analysis of the loss of metabolic, metabolic cap capabilities of kinetoplastids, have you found even more loss of metabolic capabilities among species, e.g. T. brucei, T. cruzii, and Leishmania, depending on the life cycle mm -hmm. or parasitic uh, form? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the pattern there is patchy, I would say. So uh, the evolutionary younger, let's say, put that's a dangerous uh, word. Uh, so uh, let's say the, the, the lineages at the top branches tend to have less genes. Uh, but it really probably depends on the lifestyle. And also, uh, let's bear in mind there is still 10,000 genes and we, have, we know the functions of maybe uh, 60, 70 percent of them. So now when we are, for example, uh, still uh, re-evaluating and, and we are tagging all mitochondrial proteins in trypanosome, uh, all of them, and localizing them and so on. So we, we find new lineages, uh, new, new small uh, usually, but uh, um, metabolic pathways there in the organelle. So I think it's too early to say uh, soon or in a foreseeable future, we shall be able to really uh, address this question. But uh, in summary, it seems that uh, there was a major loss when the cell transited to parasitism, but then that almost stopped. And, and the cells reshuffled their metabolisms based on their life cycle, whether they were monoxenic or pixenous, uh, having two hosts and, and uh, the type of, of the host. Uh, they found slightly different strategies, how to survive in the host, but, uh, but uh, there was no major, no significant gene loss ever since. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your answer. I have a related question to that complexity and this uh, regards euglenids or euglenophytes. Today you, you have showed and in your paper you argue that they have very complex mitochondrial proteome measured in the number of, of uh, various proteins. Yesterday, Michael, have shown that the same applies to their flagella, right? So I'm always wondering, uh, could this, could the reason or part of the reason for this be the presence of chloroplast and the chloroplast endosymbiosis that this lineage uh, uh, experienced? And uh, do you see any footprint of uh, chloroplast in the mitoproteome or flagella proteome? Uh Excellent question. And uh, as a matter of fact, Michael, who is first author and thinks a lot about this, is sitting right next to me. So if you as a chairman allowed to be answered by another person, I pass. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, certainly in the case of the mitochondria, you can see a, a, a much, a much more definite footprint from the chloroplast. There are maybe 200 or 300 proteins that could be uh, co-localized between the mitochondrion of Euglena gracilis and its plastid. Within the flagellum, uh, it's a lot more uh, ambiguous. Um, and again, answering one of the questions from one, there are no heterotrophic uh, flagellum of euclenids to compare to, but absolutely in the case of uh, euclenid mitochondria. Thank you. And uh, related to that, my second question, what do we know about the complexity of diplonemid mitochondria? Is there any mitoproteome? I'm, I don't know from the top of my head if there is mitoproteome published actually, or is it on the way, or do you know anything about it? Uh, well, I know it's on the way. It's done by the Canadian group of Gertrude Berger. Uh, and since they are doing it, we did not uh, start doing it. So uh, it's, it's really on its way, uh, but uh, not published yet. Uh, my prediction, and I don't have the data, uh, um, is that it will be similarly complex. It will probably be somewhere between Euglena mitochondrion and trypanosome mitochondrion. But that's a wild guess, but it's on the way. Okay. Yeah, so we are looking forward to that.
So uh, I don't see any raised hands and I don't see any other question in the chat, but in the meantime, so please uh, think about our questions and, and write it or, or, or raise your hand. In the meantime, I, I would like to ask the second speaker, uh, Eric, Eric Linton, uh, you were showing uh, the pattern of evolution of repeats in the chloroplast genome of, of euglenophyte, yes. right? And my vague knowledge <laughs> says that uh, the presence of these repeats has something to do with the way how the chloroplast genome is uh, replicated. Uh, but I don't have any uh, any like positive, good, precise knowledge about that. So I'm wondering, what do we know about the way how euglena or any other euglenophyte replicates its genome and could the change of the uh, genome structure affect this? It might. Uh, I don't know of any studies where they've uh, actually gone through and other people may know the replication mechanism, but uh, it seems to be very lineage specific. So it could just be, you know, there was a problem. If you look back, at the, uh, the loss of the inverter repeat, it happened three times. And I think that could be just a simple reduction of the loss of genes and the change in the structures. And then we also have the structure of the uh, varial number of tandem repeats. So I think it's just a structural change there. Uh, most euglenoids have, um, again, the euglenophyta have just a single. So they lost the inverter repeat and kept just a single copy. Uh, however, Eutreptia has a tandem repeat. And I think that was a replication problem. And if you look at the other ones, that was up in Euglena. And it's actually not just Euglena, it's a very specific lineage. Uh, I had a paper on this a couple of years ago with my student. Uh, if you look at Claire and Hemelius, and that lineage of Euglena is with Gracilis, Hemelius, and uh, Clara and Longa, those are the ones that have a tandem repeat of two or three times. But in the other Euglena lineages, Beardus and the other ones done, they have a single repeat, as is found in Trachlomonas and Monomorphina and the other ones. So I think the tandem, the loss occurred once and the tandem repeat is just something that occurred in certain lineages. And I think it was just you know, a replication error and then just got propagated on. Since it's not all over the place. And again, once we've sequenced those and we saw it, it's in one very specific Euglena lineage. The, again, the only other place where it has a complete, complete one is down in Eutreptiella, uh, sorry, Eutreptia. But there are a few scattered throughout. And on the seed, I had them with like single, but with a P, where there's some partial replicates. So in Trachlomonas ellipsidalis, it has a single you know, rRNA gene, but it also has one partial repeat on the other strand of the 16S. And, and uh, I'm trying to remember the other one off the top of my head. Stromblomonas, I think it was. It has a partial repeat of the 23S. So I think there's a few remnants but I think it's just a replication and it's just a duplication during it. So I don't think there's a specific mechanism that did it. It's just happenstance as time went on. And was there any study even in the previous century, for example, when the Euglena was actually studied a lot by classical mm -hmm. methods uh, that would show how the, uh, um, how the chloroplast genome is replicated? Not that I'm aware of. Somebody else may know it, but not that I have seen in that area. Uh, again, this is an area worth exploring, just as a lot of the mitochondrial work is being done, the chemoplastid work, but how it's done. I think most people have assumed that it's done in the same way of, of the other chloroplast genomes. However, there could be some changes since a lot of the genes got moved to the nucleus, and a lot of the other metabolic pathways that it uses are combinations of the original phagotrophic pathway, uh, green algal genomes, and also there's some combinations of the pathways that have uh, red algal components to it and, and bacterial components to it. So the pathways that I have seen for regulating genes and moving them out seem to be a combination of many different things. So uh, this almost goes to, I'm trying to remember what was the garbage pail thing that euglenoids have eaten a lot of things over time and they've gathered it. So they have a lot of different components together. Uh, but for the replication of the chloroplast, I don't think anyone's looked at it. And I think most people have assumed it's the same, but it really has not been looked at. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And actually to you is, is the next question in the chat by Alice O'Neill. Are genes lost from the chloroplast transferred to the nucleus or lost entirely? 
or do we not have enough nuclear sequencing? Okay, okay. so it's a combination. Some of the genes have been moved and when they've been looked for, um, some of the genes have been found. And like we still make this gene, but it's no longer in the chloroplast. We have the whole chloroplast genome. It's not there, but you need this gene. You need the product of this gene for the photosynthesis or some other component of the pathway to work. So we know it needs to be there. So since we can't find it in the chloroplast, it must have been transferred. However, there are other genes that aren't there that you wouldn't necessarily need. So whether those have been transferred is a different thing. And again, and based on the other pathways, the other metabolic pathways that have been done based on some of the work from Tremor's lab when we did this, uh, it's a mixture of components. Um, I can't remember the name of the pathway off the top of my head, but it had uh, green algal, again, as I said before, green algal pathways to it, red, al gray al path red algae pathways in it, and also components from uh, bacteria. So again, I think the critical ones have gotten moved, but they could have been moved over time in multiple steps, and some of them have been lost. So my opinion is it's a mixture of the two. If it needs it, it's been moved to the nucleus. If it didn't, it just lost it. Okay, thank you much. Thank you very much. And of course, we, uh, I, I, I think we all know that we don't have enough nuclear sequencing. <laughs> the yeah. end of the question yeah. is correct. We need more, more nuclear. <laughs> we need more nuclear to answer those questions of whether they're there or not. And we need more chloroplast, maybe less so than before. We've had that nice renaissance in the last 10 years on it, but there's still a half dozen or so. I think we really need to make sure we really know what's going on in the evolution of the chloroplast genome. Good. That is just came another question by Michael Ginger. Eric, you showed about 20 genes initially lost after the acquisition of the green plastid, and then only a relatively small number of genes lost between different euglenids. How unexpected is that compared with other examples of secondary endosymbiosis followed by gene loss within an algal group? So a huge loss at the beginning and then only subtle differences. Um, I think that's about the same. Again, I haven't looked at a lot of the other chloroplast loss genomes in a little while, but uh, I think there's been reductions, but I think it is initially there's a lot of reductions. Evolution seems to clean itself out pretty quickly to begin with and settle upon a core group. So I think it's fairly similar. And if somebody has some more information on that, I would say, and I can look in more to it. But I think initially after the uh, acquisition, and I'll look at some of the other lines, the losses were initially, and then certain lineages have lost genes. If you look at the large chart I had, or I can put it back up, uh, it reduced down to around about 90, but some went even further and some maintain that. So if we map all that out, we can see that there's been losses, but maybe not exactly gains, but I don't think it was all. So there was a core group that was lost, and then certain lineages, which are smaller, have lost a few genes over time. So I think we had an initial core loss of, say, he said 20 genes or so, and then a few lineages have lost a few other ones over time. So I think that's fairly common throughout. Fine, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat and no raised hands. I, I hope I'm not overlooking anyone. I had, I had then maybe your last question to Julius, back to Julius. Uh, Julius, uh, when you were comparing the kinetochore protein compositions. Uh, so in your chart, you have some part called canonical kinetochore and kinetoplastid kinetochore. So how much canonical is the can canonical kinetochore uh, protein set? Is it based on uh, human yeast and, and that's it? Or is it more widespread across eukaryotes? Um, <clears throat> so I... Uh... <laughs> optimally would have Angelica here to answer that question, but uh, it looks like kinetochores, at least from all I know, are highly conserved. So there is uh, really not big difference between yeast, senorhabditis, and human. While there is major difference of from uh, or departure uh, seen in trypanosomes. So when we looked for homologs, either the yeast ones or the trypanosome ones, in, and I will speak now for Diplonema, where we are doing this, uh, we have found very, very few. So now we have tagged them and we are pulling down the interacting proteins. And only after 
that I will be able to answer the question whether we have. So in, in principle, it looks like we have one set of kinetochor proteins in all eukaryotes except tripanosomes for now. And my prediction is that when people will start looking in unicellular lineages like dinoflagellates and diatoms carefully, they will also find quite distant kinetochor assembly uh, or family proteins uh, from, from the eukaryotic consensus, as has been found in tripanosomes, because they are forerunners and they are always studied best. Uh, so I, I cannot answer that question better than, than this at the moment, but uh, soon we shall know more. Thank you very much. So I think we are at the end of the discussion because I don't see any more contributions. And also uh, we are, the, our time is running off. So I pass my word to Fengo and I believe we are heading to break. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lada. And thanks to Judas um, Lukesh and Eric Linton for uh, the uh, very nice presentations and also for agreeing to speak to Ross here. So oh, um, oh, thank, no, God, no. thank God, I'm I, sorry. I yeah, actually I see a raised hand of Emma Savedra. I don't know if if she wants to to ask. Or follow hi, the hi everybody. I'm Emma Hello. Savedra from Mexico. I was trying to, to write rapidly, but I couldn't. I, I My question is, why is difficult to uh, see, to get the sequence of mitochondrial DNA or chloroplast DNA for a euglena? Is it difficult or why have not been sequenced? Uh, so I believe, uh, well, uh, actually, uh, so this should be to both speakers. I don't think it is difficult to sequence chloroplast DNA, but it used to, it was difficult to sequence mitochondrial DNA, right? And Julius may add something to that. Uh, yeah, it's it, it was not easy. We have uh, sequenced it and published it in uh, Genome Biology and Evolution in 2015, Dobakova et al. Uh, so uh, in principle, uh, the difference from other, especially from kinetoplastids is that uh, it's not circular, but these are linear fragments, um, many linear fragments. Um, there are only, I think we have found six genes, but after us, uh, one more was identified. Uh, so it's a highly reduced genome. And the important conclusion at the time for us was that the transcripts do not undergo RNA editing. So, uh, so we know pretty much uh, what we needed from the mitochondrial genome. And I do not expect major surprises there. So if I was asked to sequence more mitochondrial genomes, I would say, mm -mm, no, not me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, another question by Alastair Simpson arrived to the chat. So this will be the last one. I work on heterotrophs and haven't paid enough attention to Rapaza. Could someone just briefly summarize the evidence that it has a euglenophyte type plastid? Eric Clinton, please. Yeah, I just I just started to type an answer to Alistair. Um, this is from Brian's paper, and I think one other place I read it. I was reading several papers to put this together and summarize the evidence. Uh, but in there, he showed that they did two things with the Rapaza. Since it eats another algae, where was it getting the, the ability to photosynthesize? So they did two experiments they showed in the paper. One where they uh, starved it. They didn't give it any new algae to eat. and left it alone and eventually the chloroplast went down to it had a single chloroplast. And this is, and I can't remember the, the evidence beyond that, but it, it would lose all the other chloroplasts but maintain a single small chloroplast. However, this seemed to be incomplete that it couldn't survive on that alone. So if they gave it you know, plenty of good media, plenty of light, if it didn't have an input of new chloroplast, it would reduce down to a single chloroplast and it would eventually die. So if you didn't feed it or give it external food, it would eventually die. Uh, if you just put it in the dark, uh, the same thing, it could only survive for so long by eating things else, the other things. But if you didn't give it more to eat, it would eventually get down to the single chloroplast, which would just not fully functional apparently, or not capable of, of giving it enough, creating enough food for it to survive on. And this is what they deemed was probably the ancestral, the original euglenoid chloroplast. 
because it would never lose this. And this would get replicated. If you starved it and it replicated, it would continue on that if I remember the paper correctly. Uh, so that's why I thought that would be an important one to do is to sort it out, maybe starve it down or figure out how to sort that one out and see if that is that chloroplast that always stays there. Is it really a euglenoid one or is it just whatever it ate, it finally gets down to one and then eventually dies. But their theory was that was the remnant of the original secondary dose symbiosis, but it just wasn't complete yet. So okay. like I said, I can look at his evidence. But that was from the Leander et al. paper. I can't remember all the other authors right now. Thank you. We are, we are at the end, but it seems that the discussion is yeah. fru fruiting. So I will ask Pavel for a quick question and then Anja Kantowska. Uh, yeah, hi. I just wanted to, to join the conversation about mitochondrial genomes. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we are working on some mitochondrial genomes for various units, not just for Euglena, but, but uh, many other species. And we are able to more or less assemble something similar to, to what uh, Julius had done in 2015 but uh, uh, it's still work in progress, but we definitely have uh, uh, some linear fragments, but also some circular genomes in Euclidean, like beautiful circles. So that's coming up, I, I hope soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Anna, please. Well, my comment is to Rapaza basically, uh, which um, uh, I think, uh, but what well, the paper is from 2013 um, by Ibuki and, and um, basically Naji, Naji and uh, Akinori, uh, plus obviously the Brian Leander. And um, the initial interpretation was that there were two plastids, but actually, <clears throat> after years of investigation, I would say, uh, and there is no evidence anymore for the Euglenid plastid anymore there mm. uh, from the genomic data and transcriptomic data. So um, that, that would be my comment. Um, and the paper will come soon, I hope. That's what I promised to several people who are here, but um, that's, that's what the data are pointing to. Thank Thanks you, Anya. Know. So, so thank you. Thanks, everybody. So I believe now we are at the end of the discussion and uh, the break is starting. And we, yeah. so we, we got her back in eight minutes. Yeah, right. so, uh, yeah, exactly, Lada. Thank you. Uh, I think I have, we have Emma's hand, or was that a previous one? Um, otherwise, we can, Emma, do you have a question, Emma? Okay, that looks like a previous one. Yeah, Lada, so I think, yeah, we can reconvene again in eight minutes, if it does. Okay, that's it's at uh, four, four ten my time. So that should be in eight minutes, wherever you are around the world. All right, thank you. So we're just gonna wait for maybe one minute and then we start the second session. So I have a, an, a bit of an announcement, so maybe which I need to make. So I would like to welcome us to the uh, next session of, of, of the day three, uh, the evolution. And this session will focus more on the oral presentation. And it will be chaired by Anna Kwakoska. Anna Kwakoska. Um, but before then, I would like to uh, kind of just in the next few seconds talk about the, the poster session that we'll be having today. Um, as part of this, we'll be having a poster session and it's gonna be through specials. And uh, I'm gonna just post the, the uh, you know, you may already have received an email from me about specials um, yesterday. So I don't know, uh, should I post the attachment here or did everyone receive it? If you didn't receive it, just raise your hand. So I sent an attachment yesterday about specials and um, we could actually connect to uh, the, the poster session today. So if you, don't, if you didn't receive it, please just, uh, during the course of the meeting, I will, I will post it in the chat box and then you can go through it and look at how you can actually join the poster session, which will begin at, um, at 16.50, that will be 10, 10 to the hour, 
All right. Um, okay, I would like to introduce Anna Konkoska to actually chair the session. And um, yeah, thank you, Anna, for agreeing to, to chair the session. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to join uh, to this wonderful conference. And I'm happy to chair the evolution session. Uh, where we will hear more about both mitochondria and plastids um, and other aspects of organa evolution. And we'll start actually with the mitochondrial evolution uh, and the presentation will be by Magdalena Pueja from University of Warsaw. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm really glad and happy to be here with you and have this opportunity to, um, to talk about mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial DNA of Evelina. So let me just uh, share my screen with you. Hopefully uh, I can do it and do it in the... Mm. Okay, so please tell me, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I will just hide this one somewhere. Mm, just give me a second. So I'll move that somewhere here. Hopefully it will be better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so once again, hello everyone. Uh, and once again, thank you for having me today. I will be speaking about the analysis of whole genome assemblies, uh, which revealed a bizarre structure of Euglenid's mitochondrial genomes. So first, I would like to um, tell you that I will skip some part of the introduction I planned before, but uh, listen to you all before. I think that uh, it's good just to go to the, uh, to the introduc introduction, uh, basically uh, connected and regarded my study. So that is why I would like to talk especially about uh, genomes, uh, across Euglenozoa and their structure. And I base this, um, this comparison on three levels. So the nuclear, nuclear genomes, mitochondrial genomes, and also chloroplast genomes, as you can see in the, in the slide. So in terms of Euglena, we can um, say that the nuclear and mitochondrial info information is, um, is limited for Euglena gracilis. And as you all heard today, uh, the chloroplast genomes are well documented across the species. So as my study, uh, as my study um, is focused on mitochondrial, I'll be talking especially about the mitochondrial uh, genomes of, of Euglena and what we have discovered so far. So first, I would like to tell you something more about Euglena gracilis mitochondrial genome structure. So we know some, some of it, uh, and we know even more after, after our studies. So it's, uh, it's basically streamlined, as, you, uh, as you've heard today um, through the talks we, we had in the beginning. Uh, so the, stream, the streamlined mitochondrial genome uh, also uh, has few protein only few protein coding genes, which you see in the which you see in this uh, picture on the um, on the bottom, where you can find and and where where um, where um, those roughly seven basic mitochondrial protein genes are encoded. Three uh, genes of, uh, three sub genes for three subunits of NADH dehydrogenase. Three subunits of uh, um, three genes for three subunits of cytochrome C uh, oxidase, cytochrome B, uh, and also uh, two ribosomal RNA genes. Uh, also, what I would like to um, uh, highlight is that uh, we can see and we can expect this, um, this kind of uh, gene cluster for COX-3 and COX-2 uh, in, in the different um, in the different position. So going further into results, um, I would like to show you how we actually sourced those mitochondrial contexts we got during our, uh, our investigation. 
So those draft whole genomes assemblies we got for Ibuvina hermalis, Ibuvina longa, and Ibuvina gracilis gave us uh, mitochondrial contigs. Uh, and for those of you who attended uh, first day of the conference, you are probably aware that um, those data uh, were already described by my colleague. Uh, Pavel, and uh, that's why I will not um, stick to this data too long. Just uh, those of you who might not um, attended this part, I will tell that uh, tree assemblies represent many contexts of biologically meaningful size, which indicates that which indicates genomes continuity. So those um, whole genome assemblies, contigs giving blast to heat to Ubina mitochondrial genes were selected as the, as the mitochondrial ones. So now I would like to um, especially characterize those mitochondrial contigs we got. So we find dozens of linear mitochondrial contigs of different lengths, what is quite, um, quite uh, interesting and I would like to highlight it. Uh, we roughly find 99 for Euglena gracilis, 53 for Euglena hemalis, and 69 for Euglena longa, longa mitochondrial contigs out of this whole genome assemblies um, of those species. Mitochondrial contigs encode typical mitochondrial genes, as you saw on the, um, uh, in the introduction. Um, so those are those typical mitochondrial Euglena genes um, you see in the, in the table listed. Uh, however, we had uh, some trouble with uh, assembly and amplification of complete product for NAD. Uh, five gene, which is probably reduced, and um, those results, the same, uh, the same pattern and the same problems, um, uh, had some other authors before, uh, having no uh, complete um, sequence, neither complete protein product for this gene. So going further for Euglena hemalis and Euglena longa, uh, as well as Euglena gracilis mitochondrial genomes, I would like to confirm that uh, our study also um, shows uh, this mito those mitochondrial genomes to be linear. They consist of a bunch of contexts of different length of uh, average size ranging from 15 kbp to something like 40 kbp. Uh, and those contigs, um, those example of contigs I present in this picture, you can see. So we have those uh, those different uh, different different in length contigs, uh, which are um, a pool representing um, a contigs of each gene. Uh, so as you can see in the picture, we have we also found something uh, what we called internal regions of homology. So between those contexts, we can expect this kind of, uh, this kind of, um, this kind of fragment. Uh, and, and this pattern was also, um, was also observed by other authors before, um, having the size of uh, roughly um, six to seven kbp, even sometimes reaching eight kbp. All of the internal regions of homology, likewise the mitochondrial context we uh, selected, uh, being um, a representation of the mitochondrial genome, uh, are the um, are having those um, open reading frames uh, for particular genes. Uh, so the. The rest of my, my presentation, I would like to base uh, on the example of Ivina Himalis annotated mitochondrial genome. Uh, so here I would like to show you the, uh, the annotated uh, mitochondrial genome of Ivina Himalis uh, and, the, and all, only the representative um, internal regions of homology and mitochondrial context. So as you can see in the picture, here we have uh, internal regions of homology um, with the typical mitochondrial genes. 
and also the mitochondrial context for, for some of the genes uh, where we found only one contig representing a uh, representative uh, for a particular gene. That's why we're not that that's why we did not select any internal regions of homology. Uh, also, what is quite interesting, we found scattered along those internal regions of homology or the mitochondrial context, those short incomplete genes fragment, which were also reported before. before. We uh, found also um, chloroplast um, genes fragments not reported before, uh, but we did not find any concert repeats regions, um, which were also uh, stated uh, um, in earlier studies. Here, I would like to present some uh, more details on the mitochondrial context structures. Uh, structure. So here you have some of the examples um, of this deeper, um, uh, deeper structure. So we did not find gene cluster for other genes than COX-3 and COX-2, um, which cluster we can actually um, name a quite conserved cluster between the gene, between those genomes. Uh, what we found is that those protein coding genes for um, for particular mitochondrial context, they can have some neighboring uh, neighboring um, almost full um, full open reading frames fragments, but they are pseudogenes, not 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 regular uh, complete uh, complete genes. That we are running. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. So yes, keeping in mind that it's only 10 minutes of presentation and running out, out, out of time very fast, I would like to conclude that a lens mitochondrial DNA is formed by the pool of linear DNA molecules. Uh, the typical mitochondrial genes are present in Ubina hemalis, longa, and gracilis. Uh, mitochondrial DNA and whole genome assemblies, and you, as you could see, are a good source of novel organelle sequences as uh, described in the study. So uh, uh, I would like to give many thanks for my supervisors, Rafa Milanowski and Anja Karmkowska, and also my colleagues, Paweł Hałakuc and uh, Marysia Egielska, who is a master's student doing her master degree, and she really helped in this work. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. And the questions, as usually, uh, should be written in the chat. And we'll uh, quickly move to next speaker, uh, who is uh, <coughs> Alan Cheng Houtsang from University of Hong Kong. And um, the topic is uh, related with the mechanisms of phototaxis in organ aggressiveness. Hey, hello. So maybe Hi. I try to share my screen first. Uh, <coughs> Yes, it's okay. Can you see my screen? Can you yes. hear my voice? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay. So let me try. So maybe I will start. And so first of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this very interesting conference, and uh, especially under this pandemic. Um, this is really nice to see so many interesting work about a winner for many different groups of people. It's really nice to see this kind of conference happening. So I, my talk will be actually slightly different compared to the other talk, which is been more about um, photo taxes and also about the biophysics and model modeling simulation. We will have a different taste compared to the other talk, but I hope you will enjoy it as well. So this work is actually what I did when I was um, doing my postdoc with Ingmar when, um, a few years back. So maybe I will start um, talking about the motivation of how we come up with this problem. So Eugrina is a creature that we can find in freshwater pond. And uh, this has a, so you can sense the light and you can also create their own food uh, through photosynthesis. So imagine that if we have a light, uh, sunlight shining a light gradient um, on the, or over the pond surface, then we can actually, uh, the, the question is really like, how does the Eugrina find out the optimum location in the light gradient to carry out photosynthesis? So obviously the Uguina cannot come to here because the, you, uh, the sunlight is, is, uh, is just too strong. It will damage the photosensory organ of the cell. And on the other hand, the, cell, uh, the Uguina cell cannot come to here either because the light may be too weak and the cell cannot obtain enough light to carry out photosynthesis to make the food and the cell will die. And therefore it is really like an optimization problem that the Uguina need to develop 
a different photo text strategy in order to search for the optimum location for uh, effective photosynthesis. Um, so, um, so this is also why this make Euclidus to be so cool and interesting organism to study tax strategy uh, for a swimming microorganism in general. So if we look at the um, Euclidus under the microscope, this is basically uh, in general how you swim. They will actually follow a very smooth trajectory, uh, which is also what you expect to see in many swimming microorganisms. But because Euclidus cell can actually respond to light, they can also generate different motion when we provide them a light stimulus. So for example, when we increase the light intensity, the Euclidus cell will actually start to spin. And more interestingly, the Euclidus can actually swim in a polygonal trajectory when under the intermediate light intensity. And this is kind of interesting. So if we look closer to this polygonal trajectory, it's turned out that the Euclidus can swim in a triangle, they can swim in a square, or they can even swim in a pentagon. So this is really striking and interesting. Um, and we really want to know how this happened. And this is also the first time that um, this kind of polygonal pattern has been found. So, but before I go into the meat um, of why this polygonal swimming happens, provide, I will, perhaps I will provide you with some brief information about um, Eugenia phototaxis from, a, from the perspective of biophysics. So Eugenia has a flagellum, which is like the actuator for the cell to swim and turn. It also have an eye spot, which is actually not really the eyes, but the shader for the photoreceptor. So what it means is that the Uguina will actually sense the light uh, in the direction which is opposite to where the eye spot is pointing at. So when the Uguina cell is swimming, you will actually turn, roll around its body axis. You will turn around and actually point its eye spot to different direction, just like in here. And this is how the Uguina cell scan the light in 3D. So to investigate Uguina phototaxis, we actually develop a light stimulation setup so that we can uh, uh, provide the Uguina cell with different type of light stimulation and also different light patterns and look at how the Uguina cell respond to light. So the first question that we want to ask is what kind of bit patterns Uguina are generating for the behaviors they have. So it's turned out that there are two main bit patterns corresponding for the Uguina behaviors. So there are one bit patterns for the helical swimming, and there is an other bit pattern for the spinning behavior of Uguina. So the interesting thing is that if we look at the swimming phase and the turning phase of the polygonal swimming, we also see uh, the bit pattern to be very similar to what we observe in the helical uh, bit pattern for helical swimming and spinning. So what it means is that um, the polygonal swimming can actually be explained by a periodic switching between the bit pattern for helical swimming in the swimming phase and also the spinning uh, bit pattern for, this, uh, for the turning phase. So the key message that we get from this result is that uh, you're going to have two main bit patterns, but you can use these two uh, bit patterns to generate three different types of behaviors. So we also developed a biophysics model to uh, describe the winner for the taxes. So for this model, the winner can swim, they can also roll around its body axis. And because Uguina has a rotational symmetry um, about its body, and therefore we can actually um, use a body, um, a peak yard rotation to display the body axis rotation. And we can also introduce what we call a peak yard axis in here due to the rotational symmetry. And then we can ask the question that if we use the eye spot at a landmark, then how does this peak yard axis rotate with respect to the eye spot when the Uguina sends the light? So, uh, so here is the equation to describe how the, this pitch yard axis rotates uh, in respect to the light. So, so the Uguina has a long directional response to light. We capture the effect from the ambient light. It also has a directional response to light. We actually capture the, uh, the fact that the Uguina uh, can only sense the light in half a rolling cycle, and the other half will actually spin by the eye spot. So we also have a, 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 a take into account the effect of, of light adaptation, which means that the Uguina also have a memory to light. So what it means is that if the Uguina sends the same amount of light, then the response of Uguina to that amount of light will actually decay over time. So finally, um, this is like how we capture the Uguina phototaxis by using this PCR axis. So we are going to compare 
the model simulation results with our experiment to see how good they are. Um, so first, I will compare the result for the helical swimming and spinning at low light intensity at the very high light intensity. And you can actually visually see that the two results actually agree very well with each other and synchronize really well. So now we go to the interesting polygonal behavior. And you can actually see that this polygon is actually not completely a closed loop, but the polygon actually increase in size over time. And the polygon order also increases over time. And this is actually a indication, a direct indication of uh, adaptation of your winner to light. And because of the light adaptation, the turning angles of the Uguina to the light will actually decay over time. And eventually, due to the adaptation, the Uguina will have a polygon to increase in size and increase in order and form this kind of polygonal spiral. Um, so this is kind of interesting why the cell do these kind of um, behaviors, but why do the cell do this? So to so look into deep into this question to answer why the cell come up with these three different types of behavior, we consider the cell in three different types of scenario in different structure, uh, in different flow, um, a light field with different structures. So in the first scenario, we consider the cell approaching a light barrier, in, just like in here. So you can actually see that when the cell approach a light barrier, they will use the polygonal swimming and also the spinning and the strategy to escape from the light field. And we can also capture this phenomenon nicely using our simulation. So in the second scenario, we will consider the uh, winner cell initially trapped inside the light field. And you can actually see that the cell actually spin crazily due to the strong light. And then after a while, the Uguina cell will actually adapt to the light field and transition to the polygonal swimming pattern. And eventually, this polygon will even adapt further to form a larger polygon with radius. And this increases search radius of the Uguina over light. And this is how Uguina escape from the light field. So therefore, the Uguina can actually use the polygonal adaptation as a strategy uh, to search for the light edge. So in the, uh, in the final case, we actually put the Uguina inside a light gradient, and you can actually see the Uguina will transition between the spinning behavior and then to polygonal behavior, and eventually to the helical swimming and walk down the light gradient. And this is actually reminiscent to uh, what people see uh, in, the, uh, in the bacterial cell when they are doing one and tumble strategy as well, uh, to walk down the chemical gradient when they want to look for the, uh, look for the chemical food and chemical salt and look for their food. But here the Uguina actually come up with their own version of uh, one and tumble to navigate the light gradient. So this is how Uguina uh, how use the three different type of behavioral states they have to search for the uh, light, different type of light gradient and also light field. So we can also quantify the Uguina uh, behavior further by using the, what we call the anomalous diffusion behavior. So here is a plot, uh, which is showing the y-axis here, is showing the normal diffusion scale, and the x-axis here is showing the time. And according to the slope of the, of the curve of the different behavior, we can actually quantify the different enormous diffusive scale of the Uguina cells. So for the very beginning, when, when you have a, uh, when we have a spinning state, which is given by the, uh, by the green line in here, we have a negative slope, which means that the Uguina cell have a subdiffusive scale. And this is because the Uguina is, um, is actually spinning around and locally uh, with a circle. This is that why this is subdiffusive. And for the polygonal behavior, the Uguina have a very uh, have a subdiffusive at a soft time scale, and again, it's because of the polygonal looping. And for a longer time scale, the Uguina will become diffusive for the polygonal motion. You run and for the heat motion, uh, running so, so out those times, one. just just if you can. Up. Yeah, maybe 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 thirty minutes. I'm uh, thirty seconds. Sorry. So the, for the helical swimming, the Uguina will transition for ballistic to diffusive scale, and for the uh, for the one and tumble, the uh, Uguina will have an uh, intermediate scaling because it will uh, combine the three different types of behavior. So basically, the key message that we got in here is that the Uguina can select the three different type of behaviors to uh, to do different level light searching. They can, if they want to do a deep localized search, they go to the spinning and the polygonal behavior. If they want to do a global search over a larger area, they will switch to helical swimming and one and tumble. So this is how we Uguina uh, do. Uh, photos test strategy. Um, so I also want to remark that the um, uh, 
uh, the research that we did in here, we provide the light um, or functional to the Ubrina swimming direction. But usually when the people do Ubrina phototaxis, they actually provide the light in parallel to where the Ubrina swimming. Um, so I guess tomorrow, you, uh, uh, Ingman, we may give a talk to, to talk about a little bit about uh, what happens when you provide a light parallel to the Uguina and how does this uh, Uguina cell transition from positive to negative prosotaxis when you have different level of light intensity provided in parallel direction to the light. So I guess I will stop uh, end my talk in here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. For introducing us to the movement of Uglen. And now we move back to uh, mitochondria and uh, Rio Harada from Tsukuba University. We'll talk about the evolution of uh, polymer, DNA polymerase uh, localized in mitochondria in Uganda. Yes, yes, this is Rio. Can you hear my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. My name is Ryo Harada. I am a PhD student in the UG's lab at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. And I'm interested in eukaryotic evolution. And in today's presentation, I will talk about the evolution of mitochondrial localized DNA polymerases based on the single cell RNA sequencing. At first, I'm, in, I'm studying the evolution of mitochondrial localized DNA polymerase, which is the most important protein in the mitochondrial DNA maintenance. The mitochondrial localized DNA polymerase is related to bacterial DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase one or pol one. And our previous studies have shown that there are three phylogenetically distinct types of mitochondrial localized DNA polymerases in Ugrenozoa. The figure below shows the distribution of DNA polymerases in each group. The first is POL1A, which was found in kinetoplastids, diplonemids, and euglenids. And the second is POL1BCD+. This type contains POL1B, POL1C, POL1D, and its relative DNA polymerases in kinetoplastids and diplonemids. The third is POP. This type has been found only in euglenids. And based on the distribution of these polymerases, the origin of each type can be estimated as follows. The origin of POL1A is the root of Eugrenozoa, and the POL1BCD plus emerged in the common ancestor of kinetoplastids and diplonemids. And the POP was acquired on the branch leading to Eugrenida. However, this scenario may or may not be correct since we have no data from Symbionchina. Moreover, the current DNA polymerase data do not cover many basal members of Eugrenida. But, re, uh, but the right figure shows the diversity of Eugrenida. <clears throat> Our previous studies have searched for DNA polymerases in these three very studied groups. And in the remaining basal groups, DNA polymerases are not known due to a lack of sequence data. But recently, single cell transcriptome of diverse euglenids and symbionts became available. In this paper, the, they reported 25 assemblies, including deep branch members of euglenida and symbionts. So the purpose of this study is to search for DNA polymerases in these data and to re-examine the distribution and origins of mitochondrion localized DNA polymerases in Eugrenozoa. So now I briefly explain the materials and methods. First, we extracted the overreading flames from 25 assemblies and searched for DNA polymerases by BLAST. In this BLAST, uh, we used the DNA polymerase domain of E. coli DNA polymerase 1 as a query. Then, we aligned the new sequences with other representative DNA polymerases. After selecting the alignment positions, the final alignment with 369 OTUs and 309 amino acid residues was used for maximum likelihood analysis. And the resulting ML3 is shown. In this figure, the bacterial sequences are shown in orange. 
page, page sequences in green, eukaryotic sequences in blue, and the newly identified sequences in red. And the support values are ultra fast bootstrap values. And totally, we found nine DNA polymerase sequences in this study. And based on the, this ML analysis, three are most likely POP, and two are predicted to POL1A. And this sequence was found to be related to POL1BCD+. And we are not sure whether these three sequences are of eukaryotes, so that we omit them from the following analysis. Next, we analyze the smaller data set to focus on POL1A and POL1BCD+, more closely. Here is uh, we analyze the POL1A, POL1A, including the DNA polymerase found in anisonema and symbiontes. In this tree, the anisonema sequence was nested within Eugrenis POL1A, and the symbiontes sequence was placed at the most basal position in the POL1A clade. And this symbiontic POL1A sequence is particularly significant because of the two reasons. The first, this sequence is the first mitochondrial localized DNA polymerase from Symbionchida. And the second, the finding of the POL1A in Symbionchida confirms the scenario in which POL1A has already emerged in the ancestral Eugrenosa. And here is the phylogenetic analysis focusing on POL1BCD+, including a single, uh, single DNA polymerase sequence of Sphenomonas, which is the most basal group of Eugrenida. Uh, we pre previously reported the intimate affinity between POL1BCD+, and the DNA polymerase of autography bidae. The Sphenomonas DNA polymerase sequence formed a clade with POL1BCD+, and the DNA polymerase of autography viruses. In this clade, the Sphenomonas sequence grouped directly with the phage DNA polymerase instead of poran bcd <clears throat> However, the non-parametric bootstrap value for the union for, of the phage and Sphenomonas DNA polymerase was poor. The position of the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase remains unclear. At least this analysis revealed two aspects regarding the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase. First, the, the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase is the first Eugrenid DNA polymerase besides POL1A or POP. And second, the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase is likely of phage origin. And in this slide, we discuss two scenarios for the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase. If we believe the ML tree topology, the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase and POL1BCD plus cannot share the common ancestry. Therefore, we need, need to invoke uh, two independent transfers of DNA polymerase in the evolution of Eugrenozoa. One is the common ancestor of kinetoplastia and diplonemia, and the other is branch leading to Eugrenida. However, the POL1BCD plus phylogeny is essentially unresolved, and there is a possibility of the Sphenomonas uh, DNA polymerase and POL1BCD plus grouping together. If so, the Sphenomonas sequence, uh, Sphenomonas DNA polymerase can be regarded as POL1BCD plus, and we need only a single gene transfer in the early, elevo early evolution of Eugrenosa. But at this point, we cannot favor or disfavor one of the two scenarios. And this is the last slide. Uh, in this study, we searched for mitochondrial localized DNA polymerases in diverse eugrenids and symbiontes. <clears throat> and we updated the distribution of the three DNA polymerase types in eugrenozoa. Uh, and for the first time, we found POL1A from Symbionchid, and this sequence reconfirms the early origin of POL1A in Eugrenozoa. And it is also important to note that 
we identify the euglenic DNA polymerase closely related to Poran BCT plus. The phylogenetic position of the Sphenomonas DNA polymerase remains uncertain in this study, but it is critical to examine the origin of Poran BCD plus. So the origin of Poran BCD plus needs to be revisited after we achieve better sampling uh, of the DNA polymerase of phages and euglenids through further sequencing the transcriptomes or genomes of diverse euglenids. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ria. And now we'll move to the last talk in the session. We are slightly over the time, but not too bad. And this last talk is by Kasper Maciszewski from the University of Warsaw, and he will talk about evolution of plastids and, and their genomes. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? And can yes. you see my slides? Yes. Okay. That's great. Uh, I know we're pretty tight on schedule, so I'll try to make it a little bit more brief. Uh, fortunately, my talk is a little bit of a follow-up to Eric Linton's talk uh, earlier today. And I'd like to tell you a story about uh, the evolutionary paths of plastic genomes in euglenids, uh, which probably should be started by uh, mentioning that there's more to euglenids than just the genus euglena. And in fact, there, there are currently recognized 12 freshwater genera and some marine genera, while most of the high throughput sequencing data we have relates to the genus Oglena, with the genus Altiotella being the closest follow-up. Uh, but, uh, but there's a lot, a lot of interesting things to be found out in other, other organisms in this group, because they don't have to be uniform. And we probably shouldn't think they are all exactly the same and all identical to Vina gracilis, right? Uh, so as you already as you already know, plastic genomes in euglenids are a little bit peculiar. They have a number of unusual traits, unusual for plastic genomes in general, uh, one of which is the presence of group two introns, which uh, until very recently, until a paper on the basal red algal group uh, with extremely inflated plastic genomes came out, uh, we thought these are actually the most intron rich plastic genomes in general. Turns out they're not exactly, but they are still pretty intron rich. As you can see, some genes can have way more intron than exon content in, their, in terms of length. Uh, we also know that uh, the structure of plastic genomes in euglenids is evolving rather rapidly. Uh, we know there have been numerous losses and inversions of uh, other ribosomal DNA operon, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate a little bit on in a moment. Uh, so what we did, we investigated a number, of, a number of species and strains of photosynthetic euglenids. We sequenced their total genomes on the Illumina platform assembled their plastid genomes first using spades and then using a dedicated plastid and mitochondrial genome assembly tool called Novoplasty. Uh, annotated our genomes, extracted their, extracted their protein coding genes, uh, performed phylogenetic and phylogenomic analysis of respectively genes and organisms, and compared what we got with what's available in the literature. So let's start with the RDNA operon evolution, which is even more complex than we thought previously. The, the last paper on that is uh, my supervisor, Anya Kalinkowska's paper from 2018. And in that paper, the, av the available data pointed towards three losses of the inverted repeats. So three times in euglenids and in an opposite orientation copy was lost, leaving only one copy of the RDNA operon. But the additional data we obtained pointed to a much more convoluted evolutionary path here. Because uh, first of all, previously we assumed that uh, tandem repeats, which are numerous copies of the RDNA operon with, with the same orientation located consecutively one to another, uh, we thought this is like a very genus euglena specific thing, but it's not. We also observed 
that this structure was independently gained by the genus Colassium. And uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, inverted repeat losses, we now know that there were more than three of these uh, because we found the genus Facus and the genus Flexiglena to lose their to lose their inverted repeats independently of one another, and the situation is even more complicated within the within the Euglenazo family because we're not really sure which is more likely at this point whether there were inverted repeat regains following the loss or there were at least eight independent losses both of which seem quite unlikely but we don't know which one is is more unlikely at this point right so uh it's getting even more interesting when we have a look at the initial maturases, which uh, which I already mentioned. So the, the the available literature data points towards there being three different intron maturase genes and euglenids. What we found were two completely new genes that uh, that appeared independently uh, and are in a, and formed separate clades on the tree, which you're going to see in a moment. We also managed to assign using a using protein domain search, we assigned maturase function to a previously identified, but not as a maturase gene uh, named row AA. And we also additionally found, uh, found the maturase K known from plant plastids also to appear in certain species of euglenids. Uh, and with the new data available on intro numbers and maturase numbers, it seems that the previously proposed hypothesis that the number of introns and number number of maturases are proportional to one each other to one another. This correlation does not seem to hold anymore. Uh, this is actually supported by uh, by statistics that there's no correlation here according to the Spearman row test we did. So uh, so the intron maturases actually turn out not to only be separate things separate separate orthodox clusters but it seems that they are they have different origins in euglenid plastids uh, because some of these genes cluster with green algae or with cyanobacteria which makes sense because this is this is what what the origin of the plastid in euglenids is but some of them cluster with firmicutes or with other algae such as such as the green algae uh, the red algae or even with archaea so we know that there must have been some sort of horizontal gene transfer event happening repeatedly somewhere in the ancestor of euglenids, but we don't know from where. These genes are very hard, uh, are very hard to compare and to, to, to discover their origins because they have very low uh, sequence similarity to one another. They are extremely rapidly evolving. So the phylogenetic tree is the simplest method actually to classify any new maturase into any of these clusters you can see here. But what's important, uh, you probably noticed that all of these maturases, all of these clusters are widespread across the euglenid tree. Uh, actually, all of them are present both in the freshwater, freshwater euglenids, uh, the euglenalis, and the marine euglenids, euglenalis, which was the which was like the first split within uh, within photosynthetic euglenids, which indicates all the maturases, all eight, are ancestral to this group. They are acquired very, very early in their evolution. And there are even more peculiarities in, in our organisms of interest, because uh, what we managed to find in the marine Eutreptia species and two strains of Eutreptiella are the maturases that somehow managed to get one inside the other, and while the while all the maturases are also intron encoded proteins, as in they are ORFs within introns within other genes, here we have the first, first to our knowledge case in all life on Earth of a free storied gene, which is a gene within an intron within a gene within an intron within a gene. So they form this uh, this structure resembling a Russian doll uh, or matryoshka. And in the paper that's currently in, in review, we we coined the name Maturioshka for it, which is a Maturioshka of maturases. We don't know if the if the reviewers are gonna are gonna accept our our fancy name for it, but we're really hopeful. 
I think it's pretty self-explanatory and, uh, and a very nice and original name. So to sum it up, uh, the, the plastic genomes of euglenids have brought a lot of surprising, a lot of surprising discoveries for us. Uh, the most important of which, to my, in my opinion, is that we found new genes in plastic genomes, which is not a very common occurrence. We usually think of endosymbiotic gene transfer that follows the acquisition of the plastid as an unidirectional process. So the plastids evolve toward smaller gene content within their genomes, but here we have a very prominent uh, exception from this because we have plastic genomes that repeatedly gain genes probably from different sources, also by duplication, but also, but also from horizontal gene transfer, which is very weird, very, very interesting and worth taking a closer look. So, uh, and I think it's, I think it's, it's really, it's really, really important to study more than the model representative of a group because you can find lots of things that you were not expecting to find or even weird genetic uh, genetic peculiarities that were never found in any other group so far. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you to the organizers of, uh, of this conference for giving me a chance to present my results. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, Kasper. Actually, everybody now is open for questions because we are uh, with this talk uh, finished this session and uh, we'll move now to the discussion and questions to all of the speakers. So we'll first, um, uh, we'll just read the questions in the order they, they showed up. Mm, let me come back to the beginning of the session. I think the first question was from Yuji Nagaki. Uh, it was to everyone, but I'm guessing it's to Magda, actually. And this, uh, the question is, is the normal sequence library constru construction uh, without, I think, whole genome amplification in this case, uh, insufficient to sequence the meta uh, mitochondrial genome fragment in Euglena species? Uh, okay, so thank you for this question. Uh, I think that th there has to be uh, some misunderstanding of the abbreviation. So whole genome assembly versus whole genome amplification. and. Surely, um, I can say that whole genome assembly, uh, we had, um, we didn't uh, need any of the whole genome amplification, whereas it's uh, quite needed in single cell, for example, um, analysis and then amplification of the whole to get the enough DNA um, or sufficient DNA um, uh, levels. So, uh, so here I will just like to clear that the whole genome assembly, meaning that we sequence the whole genomes having the complete um, nuclear uh, mitochondrial and also chloroplast actually DNA um, during the sequencing, and then we could actually dig in and actually dig out what we wanted. So I hope I revealed this. If I didn't, please let me know. If you didn't, I think the, 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 there will be a follow-up question, but I understood. I think that was the, yeah, the, the different interpretation of the, of the, of the abbreviation. abbreviation. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question um, is also written to everyone, but I assume based on the uh, question that it is actually the question to um, Alan and the question is from Antonio de Simone and uh, the question is how strong is light intensity to induce polygonal swimming? Are these light intensities likely to be encountered in nature? Um, uh, thank you very much for the questions and um, I, I guess maybe I try to share my screen again <laughs> in order to better answer these questions. Um, so we actually really did a light intensity analysis to see what level of light intensity to induce different behaviors. So actually you can see from this plot that the polygonal swimming behavior will actually be to be around like 300 to around 1000 lux, 500 lux, I would say that you can see most of the cells and that will see the polygonal behaviors. Uh, so to, just to give you like an idea of how strong this light intensity is, uh, so if you have an LED table lamp and you uh, around like 10 inches 
10 interest and you try to put it on the table and you put the papers uh, on your table, this will be um, about the, uh, the, the same level of like intensity shining on the papers, I would say. So um, so whether this amount of like intensity uh, is going to happen in Asia and the answer is yes, I would say, because the sunlight is actually much stronger than this level of like intensity. And, and usually the cell will, will, uh, will stay in some shadow of the, of the plant and also uh, inside deep waters, uh, uh, inside the water, which will actually decrease certain level of like intensity uh, to extend that um, and certainly 500 lux to 1000 lux is something that um, the cell will encounter in nature. Okay, so I guess uh, I hope that this will answer the question. And that there is another question to you. Uh, on, uh, does these light behaviors have any influence in the biological processes? Um, yes. Oh, uh, it's a biophysics, so, but still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, sorry, maybe I also need to share my screen again. So, so, so um, the thing is that because I don't have enough time, so I'll skip a lot of details, but. Um, but the three, the three cases that we're trying to consider uh, here is actually also biologically relevant and kind of trying to mimic some of the scenario that the cell may encounter in real life. So for example, when the cell approaching a light barrier in here, you, you can actually imagine that it is uh, like a case that when the cell is um, staying under a shadow of a plant, perhaps under a leaf, when you try to uh, swim into an area where the sunlight is suddenly um, where the sunlight is exposed to, and this will be more like what the cell will do, I would say. Or you can also say, uh, imagine that there may be a situation that the, uh, the sunlight may actually uh, appear suddenly from behind the crowd, which will be uh, induce a light field directly on the cell, which you will actually see um, in, uh, in this case, the light will be more like trapped inside the light field. Uh, due to the sudden appearance of the sunlight. And finally, at, at the side of the very beginning, um, when the sun is um, um, shining on the water surface, usually you will create a light gradient. And this is more like what will happen in the, in the last scenario. Um, so we do actually select um, the study that we did um, based on some um, ecologically relevant scenario, I would say. And of course, we are not trying to make a direct linkage to the um, to the biological um, scenario, because this is also have a lot of control that you will need to do, but this is more like uh, inspired by uh, what is happening in nature. Okay. Thank you. So and I now, uh, even more questions to you <laughs> about the <laughs> yes, movement uh, and behavior, actually. Um, so the question is um, from Pavel, does a Wilna movement change or when it is escaping the light or swimming towards it? And also, are you going to check or did you check if different taxis types have the same uh, patterns, photo taxis? Yes, uh, yes, excellent question. So, so actually the, um, when the cells swim away from different light field and change, they do actually switch the swimming behavior accordingly. Like um, at different light level, they switch the different um, uh, swimming behaviors. And usually when the cell escape from the light field, they will just switch it back to their normal swimming state, which is more like a helical swimming trajectory that you, you normally see how the cell swim. So um, so for about the second part of the question, are you go, um, yeah, we certainly we're trying to make the linkage of how this behavioral state that we observe and how um, with, with, with the normal phototaxis in parallel to the light, uh, which I don't have time to, uh, to talk about this part in the talk, but maybe perhaps you may um, hear some of the news about this from, from IGMA tomorrow, I guess, and there will be some uh, progress that we have made on this topic, yeah, to this regard. Okay, and, and I think the last question about your talk is about the, there was some follow-up discussion, but basically the question mm -hmm. is, did you, did you check this behavior under different uh, culturing conditions, uh, meaning phototrophic, like a mix of, if, if you check <laughs> it under mixotrophic growth, basically, whatever would be the source of the carbon in this case. So, so we actually did the experiment with the cell inside as normal soil water cultures, like uh, normally how you keep the Uguina cell. It's not really like a special culture that we, we prepare with the glucose acting inside. But of course, this is kind of interesting that uh, if you use different cultures, then you may see different type of behavior of the Uguina cells. From, from what I know is that um, uh, some, for some calcium, which culture, then you may actually see the flagella bit of the uguina to behave a little bit differently. And the cell may generate different swimming behavior when you have uh, some 
calcium rich culture. But other than that, I, I'm not very sure about how the, what happened for the calcium, um, uh, for, for having a Google switch culture. But this is certainly a very interesting question that um, they well, were I guess, answering. I guess the motivation, yeah. if, if it's a mixotroph, then the light is of less importance, slightly less important. Yeah, 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 can be true. 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 Okay, thank uh, yeah. you. And then now we're coming back to Magda for a while um, and the question about mitochondrial DNA. Uh, from Vladimir Hamble, do the ends of the mitochondrial DNA fragments have some notable features, uh, devoid GC content, repeats, etc. Magda, uh, please turn on your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So answering this, this question, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, we were um, looking through the context and we cannot find any very conservative fragments on those um, overhangs, let's say. Um, however, the, the contexts are, are quite AT rich, which is quite, I would say, expected in case of mitochondrial um, DNAs. So, uh, in, in, so I hope that's, um, I hope that's fulfilling. If not, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, and now we, we come into the questions to uh, Rio. And the question, first question is about, um, is there any ongoing work on the, uh, I guess, modeling of the structure of the uh, new polymerase pop and uh, how the structure compares, is in comparison to, uh, uh, to the other polymerase? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I also analyze uh, Phylogenetic analysis of POPs, but it has not so much resolution, so I didn't talk in, in today's presentation. But however, it seems that POPs are being acquired multiple times in Ugrinida. And about the structure of POPs, the, the single cell transcriptome has the, so much partial sequences and the this pop sequence is, is partial too, so we cannot discuss about the, the whole structure and about the function of for one a for one a was the, related to DNA polymerase sheeta, the which is a nucleus the repair protein. So it was hypothesis to uh, hypothesis that for one a is maybe related to the mitochondrial DNA repair or maintenance, but, but we have no data for, for the functions. Is, is, this, is it answer? Mm. Thank you. Yes, I think you, you more or less covered the, the question was about structure and the, and the comparison. Um, and we also are a little bit sh short of time, so we'll move and if, if any of the answers were not not sufficient enough, please, please we follow up questions. Um, um, if we move further- Can I also I... answer my questions, sorry. Because I- Yeah, I'm coming to the questions there. for you, no worries. <laughs> I'm coming <Right>. there. <laughs> uh, well, basically there is one question. Um, uh, is the application of Clatsum Cronatum uh, of the rRNA uh, similar to, um, similar to Clatsum Vesiculosum um, or which is a partial repeat? Actually, no, this is very, very much different because what we found are two complete tandem repeats and one incomplete. So it looks a little bit like those in uh, Uglena gracilis because we have a 16, 16, 23, 16, 23. And the genome is circular. We managed to close it. So yeah, actually the newer, the new version of Novoplasty works like a charm. I mean, it can assemble everything into a circle. That's a game changer, really. And about the papers, uh, yeah, actually we have, uh, we're planning to put all this, all those 11 genomes into two papers. One of them focuses on maturase evolution and it's in review and the other one is in preparation. And we're gonna try to reconstruct the ancestral states to, to try to pinpoint where the repeats were gained and lost. 
So that's going to be divided into two separate studies. And the figures you use on my talk are all from the paper in review. Yes. Okay, thank you. And we have a very last question. I will just, uh, we'll have a slightly short break uh, from Alistair Simpson. I think it, it's about, again, about the photo, um, photo taxis. Do we know uh, that the polygonal behavior uses detection of the light angle or could the cell be using surface contact or gravity to know when to turn? Given the seem to, <laughs> yeah, once per roll rotation, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, so, so I guess the um, so I guess the the question you know uh, the uh, this is uh, the, we actually try different uh, experiment and try different um, water level that when the we also observe the polygonal behavior even in very deep water uh, chambers in a very deep water chamber it definitely has nothing to do with the surface effect and um, not whether they have effect to gravity we we are not. 100% sure, but because we cannot neglect gravity anyway. Uh, but what we we actually can correlate with the Euclidean motion with is actually the, how they sense the light. So whenever when the cell try to roll itself and try to point the photoreceptor to the light that we provide from below, that the cell will actually try to turn to the direction of orthogonal to the light. And and after the cell swim into and half uh, the continues to roll and they try to turn. They will eventually come with a position where they, they say they will actually block the light and they just say we just keep on swimming. But when the cell tries to rotate again and roll again, then, then the, uh, the photoreceptor will sense the light again and that's why the cell will turn again. So this is how we see uh, the cell do the polygonal swimming. So it has more to do with the light sensation rather than this kind of surface contact and, and stuff. Okay, with that, uh, we'll end this uh, session. Thank you very much, all the speakers, and all the uh, for all the questions uh, and and the whole discussion. And now we have short break, seven minutes, and then we try to move to this yeah. poster session. If if you want to tell something, maybe more. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, chairing this, and to all the speakers. And that's uh, uh, basically talked about some developments in Iglina. So one of the things we want to do is to um, kind of have the poster session, as I mentioned previously, so there are about 11 or 12 or so. So it'd be nice for us to also attend this poster session. So I've pasted um, a, a, I think it's a, a readme on how to connect to the special platform. So I'm gonna paste it again uh, for the benefit of those who, who couldn't, um, uh, attend who, who didn't say it previously. So just give me one minute. Um, okay, so I'm pasting it again in the chat box. So please feel free to go through the, the, the you know, how to connect to specials and then you would see the uh, poster uh, um, um, presenters there. So the idea is for us to, so they, they would actually be there now. So we kind of have the break you know, merge with the poster session. So we'll be back at um, 17.55, my time. So just five minutes to the hours, your time, uh, just to kind of wrap up and things. So it'd be nice for us to also listen to them and support them in terms of- Well, thank uh, God, we'll have to close out a Zoom to get access to that other platform, right? No, um, I don't really think you have to do that, though I understand that for a uh, good experience that you might want to do that, but I would, prefer that if it's possible that um, you can actually you, have you a good need, experience. No, you need two microphones and you need two, oh. two videos, so you can't okay. do it. All right, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's fine. When when I did it together with Ross, I had to mute, mute the microphone on Zoom. And then, uh, yeah, so that's, otherwise please feel free to close Zoom and then go over there, uh, basically. But if we can actually have, you know, still be on the Zoom, that would be nice. Just mute and uh, you know put your video on stop and then interact. We'll be back at five to the hour, please. If that's okay. All right, see you. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, thanks to everyone who waited behind for the for the poster session. Um, that was uh, enjoyable. Uh, this is that was my first time in in special poster session. 
Um, most people did reported that it, it was good. Then I think it, for some people, it's the first time it, it was difficult to, to get around it in the first instance. So I would like to thank everyone of us for coming um, to, this, to the day three of the, of the Congress. So we're at the end of, the, of today's session. And um, tomorrow we'll be uh, looking at the final grand challenge, mainly translation and commercialization. And I, I understand that it promises to be engaging. Uh, this is where we'll begin to see the, the several applications of the science of Iglina. And I think for me personally, uh, those applications are one of the things that actually, one of the motivation of actors, I think that we should really engage this this organism as, as a model system and begin to explore it more. So um, just a bit of a clarification. Tomorrow, uh, during the tomorrow session, we'll be talking about the next conference, which, which we aim uh, will, um, will, will be held in Toronto and hopefully would be um, a hybrid or physical conference, depending on what the situation is. So uh, Scott will be talking more about that uh, conference. And uh, we're planning for the conference in 2023 to be held in Prague. So uh, let me Hampu has agreed to hold the conference for us. And we're looking for uh, a host in Southeast Asia, uh, maybe Japan or China. If anyone is here happy, Ishikawa, Masami. I mean, if you're happy, then please uh, do send me an email. Are you happy to? <laughs> so we can talk about it. Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, good. So uh, is that, shall I do an email to kind of, confirm that to say um, that would be the year after because the idea is that we need to know where the conference would hold like a year or two years before and that makes things easier for us and uh, also so tomorrow also we'll, we'll be talking about the the next step that we're thinking about in the network the Galena network uh, that would involve you know what where do we go with with the network mainly looking at formalization of the network and I think uh, John Knight will be talking about about that as well and finally, I think I had one more thing in my head, uh, which I can. So maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow, basically. And I would like to thank everyone for coming. So I don't know if there's any more questions, comments, or things we should discuss. Uh, Scott, is that it? And uh, also, I can we keep the conference online or make sure it always has good online option? It makes it so nice to attend. Yeah, obviously, uh, Igma. Uh, that is also something we're considering. So I'm sure Scott will, in the next conference, in, in, in that's Scott. So the, the idea again is to move things around. So, uh, so now that this has been coordinated from the UK, then the next one, Scott will decide if he wants to make it hybrid, physical, or purely online. So that is up to Scott. And then we'll kind of move things around a bit. And for this conference, it has been free, mainly because we would like to thank everyone, all the partners, uh, the ALM Institute, uh, Nobogen, Manchester uh, Institute of Biotechnology and the Uglena Network for actually coming together to support this. So for instance, um, tomorrow Scott will be talking about some of the support as well from the Airline Institute, from Nobogen and also from uh, uh, the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology. And there are also other members of the committee that have been supporting this. So I'm going to talk about that uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, about five or seven of, of us that work together to make this happen. And it has been free. But from next conference, we aim that this, this would, um, maybe Scott would tell us more about that. So we are at the top of the hour. I would like to thank us again for coming and for everyone who presented today. Thank you so much. And see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. GMT, please.